Today I thought it would be fun to make up a batch of my second favorite element, bromine. I've done this once before on this channel, but I like this method much more, and I'll get into why later on. In the meantime, to get started, I first weigh out 153 grams, or nearly 1.5 moles, of sodium bromide. For this step, I would strongly recommend adding sodium bromide to water instead of how I did it here if you want to save yourself some headache. Once the sodium bromide does completely dissolve, I transfer it to a 3-neck round-bottom boiling flask to which I then connect an addition funnel. This is filled with 75 grams or around 0.75 moles of 98% sulfuric acid, which is slowly dripped into the sodium bromide solution under constant stirring. This reaction might require external cooling as it's very exothermic and actually produces hydrobromic acid in solution. Hydrobromic acid itself usually exists in a slight equilibrium with bromine, which will discolor the solution a pale yellow color as more hydrobromic acid is produced. In the meantime, I use this little intermission to make a few ampules, and this is simply done by taking a small test tube, blasting it with a propane torch, and then pulling out the neck as long as possible while still leaving an opening. This tiny reduced neck can later be easily melted with the torch and then the neck pulled out completely to create a sealed ampule. Doing this is highly recommended for storing bromine long term, as bromine is extremely volatile and will slowly evaporate out of any other container it's stored in. Anyway, once I had made about 5 of these, I checked back in on my boiling flask to find that all of the sulfuric acid had been added. I then set this up for a simple distillation from the center neck, along with an addition funnel on the left neck, and a thermometer on the right neck of the boiling flask. The addition funnel is filled with 30% hydrogen peroxide, which is then slowly dripped into the acidic bromide solution under constant stirring. What's happening now is a fairly basic single replacement reaction between one molecule of hydrogen peroxide and two molecules of hydrobromic acid. Essentially, the second oxygen of hydrogen peroxide has more affinity for hydrogen than it does for the water molecule it's already bound to. Since hydrobromic acid is an extremely strong acid, its hydrogen doesn't have much affinity for the bromide, and will readily leave to bond to the oxygen provided by the peroxide. Now, in order for these new bonds to form, the hydrogens that were previously bound to the bromides need to take their electrons with them, leaving the bromines in an uncharged state, making this technically a redox reaction, wherein peroxide oxidizes hydrobromic acid. Uncharged bromine is a halogen, and is thus one electron shy of filling its octet. Under the conditions provided by this reaction, the easiest way to fix this is for two of the newly formed bromines to share one electron with each other, forming a covalent bond, and thus the reaction is complete. Now, the mechanism here is somewhat more complex than the method I showed last time. Back then, I simply reacted chlorine with sodium bromide, and since chlorine has a stronger affinity for sodium, they simply replaced each other, forming sodium chloride and bromine. The issue with this method is that it requires working with chlorine gas in addition to bromine, or the messy formation of chlorine in situ, which is the route I took. This method also likely formed messy bromine monochloride gas, which is quite dangerous on its own and likely reduced my yield significantly as its formation is favored in such a reaction. The method I show here is much cleaner, resulted in much higher yields, and could be done with any number of oxidizers instead of peroxide, such as potassium permanganate. The reaction between peroxide and hydrobromic acid here isn't so exothermic that it can too easily get out of hand, but it is exothermic enough to distill much of the bromine produced on its own. To that end, the thermometer was added to monitor the temperature of the reaction itself, which should be held between 55 and 60 degrees Celsius for the duration of the peroxide addition, which amounts to around 150 milliliters in a large stoichiometric excess. This temperature will allow bromine to boil away without allowing any meaningful amount of water to boil away with it. This is another aspect of this reaction that is superior to my last one, as the reaction between hypochlorite and hydrochloric acid paired with the subsequent reaction between chlorine and sodium bromide is so exothermic that a significant amount of water is inevitably distilled over. Anyway, once all the peroxide had been added, I next placed a heating mantle under my boiling flask that I'd wired up to a fan voltage controller since glass coal controllers are obnoxiously overpriced. This provided additional heating now that the reaction itself was no longer providing any heat of its own and allowed me to distill over the remainder of my bromine. 
Once no more bromine was distilling over, I went ahead and cut the heat and removed my collection flask. Bromine has a density over three times higher than water, so even though there was only about 50 milliliters of bromine in here, the flask was remarkably heavy, and swirling the liquid around was somewhat similar to swirling a flask of mercury. That is, if you ignore for a second that mercury is over 13 times as dense as water. The bromine was then transferred to a separatory funnel and drained away leaving behind the water that had found its way over. This was then collected and stored as useful bromine water. The bromine was then added back to the flask along with 40 milliliters of ice cold 98% sulfuric acid to help dry away any remaining water. The flask was gently shaken, the layers allowed to separate, and then a small amount of bromine drained into a beaker so that I could start the process of sealing it in my ampules from earlier. Being three times denser than water and lacking any adhesive force, pipetting it from the beaker to my ampule didn't work particularly well. A thinner pipette with a manual pro pipetter worked better to reduce my losses, but after this first ampule, I simply used my brain and moved the beaker closer to the ampule. Once the ampules were mostly full of bromine, I simply blasted the thin neck with a torch like I mentioned earlier, and then gently pulled up on the neck to close the seal. When everything was finished, I had filled six ampules, and you'll have to excuse the goofy one. This is about six times the yield that I got the first time making bromine, although to be fair, that time I only used 102 grams of sodium bromide. I also got this little vial of bromine water, which should be quite clean as it was distilled. As I hope you'll agree, these bromine samples are absolutely beautiful, and should be handled with nothing but the utmost of care. I like to store these under sand and sodium thiosulfate in my garage. You'll also notice that unlike water, bromine doesn't get wet inside of the glass. The presence of any water though will allow bromine to wet glass, which you saw earlier in my collection flask. As for a yield here, I didn't precisely weigh or measure it, as I don't like this stuff to be uncontained any longer than is absolutely necessary. However, the maximum yield for this reaction was around 120 grams based on how much sodium bromide I used, and thus would represent about 38.5 milliliters based on the density of bromine. Looking back at the footage from earlier, the only graduated containers it was in seemed to indicate a volume very close to this, so I'm just going to say the yield was satisfactory. Anyway, now that I've got bromine, it's time to turn to the rather annoying cleanup process along with a few demonstrations. Bromine gas itself can be cleared out of any container it's still hanging around in by simply dumping it out in a fume hood, assuming you have adequate ventilation and assuming that your ventilation output isn't anywhere near where other people might be. As far as bromine dissolved in water, like in my boiling flask here, it can pretty much be completely neutralized using an alkaline reducing solution. Here you'll notice that the yellow color never really went away, and this is because I didn't realize that the solution was still quite acidic. As for the sulfuric acid I used to dry my bromine, I'm not really sure how to deal with this. I tried heating it on a hot plate to drive out all the bromine, but even after significant heating and stirring, the acid still retained a distinct yellow color. This could be due to some chemical reaction between the bromine and sulfuric acid, or simply stubbornly dissolved bromine. Either way, I have this in its own special waste container until I figure out what to do with it. Now that that was out of the way, I decided to sacrifice one of my bromine ampules to demonstrate the reactivity of this element. One of the most famous reactions with bromine is with aluminum metal, which you can actually do fairly safely as it takes about 20 seconds for the bromine to eat through the outer layer of aluminum oxide. As soon as it does though, the two violently react generating white sparks of molten aluminum and the salt aluminum bromide. This first reaction was actually so violent that it shot about half of the aluminum out of the tube, so to finish the reaction up I just adjusted my camera to get a different angle and added another piece of aluminum. Bromine will also react with different nonmetals, most famously in its reaction with red phosphorus. When bromine comes in contact with red phosphorus in a test tube like this, there's a brief flame followed by the entire inside of the tube turning first orange and then yellow. This yellow substance is phosphorus pentabromide, and is like a less useful version of phosphorus pentachloride, which I could make a video on if there's any interest. Given that these two react in a 5 to 1 ratio, there's quite a bit of unreacted phosphorus that I then scoop out of my tube along with the yellow phosphorus pentabromide. Now, when bromine reacts with phosphorus in open air like this, it simply ignites. 
And this will actually burn for quite a while, but the vapors this is putting out can't be the safest in the world, so I went ahead and put it out myself. I also considered showing the reaction between bromine and sulfur, but given the offensive odor of sulfur chlorides, I decided against it. Instead, I decided to try reacting some magnesium metal with bromine, which was actually fairly anticlimactic. The two didn't react even once a substantial amount of heat was applied, so in a last resort and thinking that this was similar to the reaction between iodine and aluminum, I decided to add a bit of water, which definitely got things going. This reaction wasn't nearly as spectacular as the bromine and aluminum reaction, but it was pretty alright. One final thing I figured I'd show is the addition of bromine to water, as I still had some bromine left in the ampule, but nothing left to react it with. As you can see here, bromine will quickly sink to the bottom given its massive density relative to water. It will also quickly discolor the water as it dissolves, and you can dissolve about 3.41 grams of bromine in 100 milliliters of water which can be a fairly convenient way to store it and use it for certain types of reactions. This solubility increases as temperature decreases and will off-gas very minimally compared to a sealed container of pure bromine. In any case, that's all I have for today. I hope you found this video interesting and as always, I wanna thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.